it's uh, nice to be back in Barcelona in real life and in person. The video you just saw tells a little bit about who we are. We're Millicom or Tigo, as our customers know us. We're squarely focused in Latin America. As you saw, we do broadband connectivity. We do it fixed and we do it in mobile, and largely with increasing amounts of convergence. We serve over 58 million customers in 10 markets. And in the last three years, we have done $5 billion in acquisitions just in Central America. But most importantly, we move at our own rhythm with Sangre Tigo. And the reason for that is because we operate in markets that require us to adjust. You saw Anne and you saw Andy operate in developed markets. We operate in developing markets. So we need to adjust to those markets. And the reason is simple. We need to have a very cost-efficient model because our ARPUs are around $5 a month. And we have the same amount of increasing demand for more and more connectivity and the additional challenge of getting to those that remain unconnected so that we can drive penetration, digital highways that get built all the way from Paraguay to Guatemala. Because the landscape in Latin America is big. It's about 700 million people in Latin America. That's about half the size of China. And in terms of GDP, right about the Indian GDP. And just in the markets in which we, Tigo, operate, we cover 130 million people and 30 to 40 million households. But we remain a region that sometimes gets bypassed, forgotten, sometimes misunderstood or misrepresented. And that's why Garcia Marquez, if you've read 100 Years of Solitude, always referred to the loneliness of Latin America. So I want to use my time to talk a little bit about our region and what we're doing there for connectivity. I want to talk on behalf of, with the voice of our region, Latin America, and show you some of the beautiful, magical realism that happens in our market when we connect people to the world. Now, we all know that Latin America was the region that perhaps was the most hit by COVID. GDP decreased significantly more than it did anywhere else, and foreign investment, which is so key to this region, plummeted by 45% in 2020. But it is also the region that is coming back the strongest, with strong and positive GDP growth, amazingly high vaccination rates, it's a population that wants to join the world, and with continued, continued stability. And this will be my main point today, and hopefully I can make it come across. This is a region that is finding its way to be connected to the world, and coming out with a sustainable and inclusive growth model that we believe is finding a way to do it with digital services. So of course, I have to speak about two different Latin Americas. The one that many of you are likely more familiar with, Brazil and Mexico and Argentina, with their fiscal spend and, and sometimes currency crisis, and a different group of countries. The countries we operate in, all throughout Central America, and Colombia and Paraguay and Bolivia, where despite Everything that you likely hear and read about, immigration, violence, gangs, poverty, the magical reality is that these economies are growing. Foreign exchanges are stable. Fiscal policy is practice. And growth happens every day. And the reason for that is because there is that magical thing called a middle class that wants a better life for themselves and for their kids. Over the next 10 years, this region where we operate in is expected to grow its middle class by 6.6%. And we all know in this room that the middle class growth generates household formation and demand for telecom filters. So you will wonder, why is all this so possible? 
in this forgotten solitary part. It is because the other side of that migration that happens out of Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, all of Central America, is all those hard-working employees from El Paso all the way to New Jersey that are using their hard work to send money back home. They don't go to America because the weather's better or because the food is better or because they can dance in the U.S. They go to their work and they send that money back. And that money back, those remittances are providing growth and economic stability in the region. Let's take a simple example, Guatemala. Remittances, $15 billion a year, growing 35% and representing 15% of GDP. So hopefully, by now you catch my drift. We are bullish, we are focused, and we're believers in this region. And I want to turn to our sector for a minute so you understand why we are so. These are growing economies. I've already said that. It's a growing middle class, increasing remittances that provide stability. But there's also meaningful underpenetration in our sector, in broadband. On average, only half of the population today uses a 4G connection. On average, only a third of the households in our markets today have access to reliable broadband at home. Imagine the amount of fiber we still have to build. My point is that this other Latin America, the one I'm referring to, is catching up and is doing so very, very quickly. And I believe, we believe, that it can actually leapfrog into digitally-led, sustained development. Now, before I go into why I'm so bullish, let me just address another area of underpenetration, which will be important later on. About 50% of the Latin American population today remains outside of the financial system, unbanked, unserved, with no access to credit. So altogether, what I am saying is simply that we in this region have both a business opportunity on the left and a tremendous social responsibility on the right. On the left, it's simply the sources of financing. It's the capital markets that we drive money from. Every single penny we invest in Latin America comes from New York, where we're traded, or Stockholm, where we're also traded, the capital markets of the world. And we use every one of those pennies to create digital highways in our markets. That's what's on the right, the uses of our financing. And the model needs to have the ability to continue that marvelous circle continuing to work so that we can have sustainable, sustainable digital model to grow. The first step for that is to understand, to acknowledge that the funds come from abroad, from the international markets. The International Development Bank estimates that Latin America needs to close its digital divide $50 billion for fixed broadband and $20 billion for mobile broadband. And all of those need to believe in a region to be our sources of finances. The second step, and allow me to say this somewhat facetiously, is that we need to stop using the word telco or mobile or cable and stop saying 4G, 5G, or 6G. I believe in our markets, we need to start saying digital infrastructure. Digital infrastructure for the digital development of our underdeveloped economies. Because just like coffee and bananas and textiles, they need roads, they need ports, and they need airports. That physical economy needs physical infrastructure. Bytes, bits, the digital economy, it needs digital infrastructure. But only if we call it infrastructure, we will understand that it affects every sector of the economy and that its impact 
goes beyond our own sector. That's the definition of infrastructure. So much so that estimates suggest that only a 10% increase in the penetration of broadband yields almost a 2% increase in GDP in our markets. That's the impact of infrastructure. Now allow me one last point, one last statistic to round out my point. 50% of the Central American population, 50%, is between the ages of 10 and 19, less than 20 years old. That's what economists call a population dividend. In a more simple manner, what it means is that young kids, they're using their phones and they're playing games on their phones, but what they're really doing is they're adopting digital. And believe me, many of them, because we see it, because they work for us, they're teaching themselves how to code. Not all of them, but enough of them. So what I see happening is a little bit of alchemy, a little bit of an experiment in Latin America, where you're adding digital highways to a very young population. And I believe that will lead to innovation and to growth and to less migration because that tech talent will be able to work out of Tegucigalpa and not have to cross the border into the US. Half of those are already working for us. When you think about the cost, the benefits to the economies, it is simple to just understand that these tech programmers that some years from today will be working for Silicon, they are half the cost in our markets than they are in Eastern Europe, or a quarter of what they are in Miami. This is beginning to happen. And I realize that this dream will not happen tomorrow. I get it. But I was reminded that some have been here before. So was FDR, before the internet. And he was very clear, if you bring him to today, that these digital highways were building for a new generation. Now, before I run out of time, I realize that I have to go from this vision into answering the question that I was asked to answer. What does the telco of the future in our markets look like? If I don't answer, my guess is you will want your money back. I'm gonna answer it the Latino way. So I wanna switch from magical realism to the digital reality in America, and do so with a lot of focus. There are three things that we believe are essential. One, to be network-centric. Two, to be very customer-focused. And three, to be very convergence-driven. Now, it is our fundamental view that what we need to do as operators is to deliver first and foremost great connectivity. That's the building blocks. That's what customers want. I guess if I were to ask you what you want from your operator, nine out of 10, if not 10 out of 10 of you would tell me, give me great connectivity. I believe that great connectivity is the ticket to play. It's a ticket to play in this space and the ticket to play in future spaces for our business. I usually say that the magic starts with the network, speed, reliability, ubiquity. And that's what makes customers stick. That's how you create brand loyalty. And that is precisely, absurdly as it may sound, how you become much more than just a dumb pipe. I believe, we believe, that the way not to be just a dumb pipe is actually to start by being a really, really good pipe. And that's why we have focused all of our CapEx everywhere we operate in building state-of-the-art best networks that we possibly can, fixed and mobile and convergent. And that's how throughout the pandemic, we actually added 3 million mobile customers and 700,000 residential customers. Because if the magic is in the network, then I must also say that we need to remain in the business of producing bits and bytes. Bytes, it's what rides on those digital highways. Bytes is what our customers actually consume when they're doing Zoom or social media or whatever it is that they're doing. 
And the secret sauce for us to continue to be the best possible pipe is to have the lowest cost of production of what the underlying service really is, bits. And that is the only way we're going to get into lower ARPUs with higher usage and more penetration, lower cost of production, the network. Now, in our view, this digital telco, this emerging market telco, this needs to become the pipe of choice, the trusted connectivity brand, the pipe that commands pricing power from customers and attracts partners, value-added partners. If you get the connectivity right, if you become that better pipe, that actually gives you the right, the entry point to the rest to become a digital enabler. And I believe that that's how we find, as a telco, our role in the ecosystem. It's an ecosystem that today is full of big fish and new fish, well-funded and evolving. But we have three great roles to play that bring value added. We can be a great partner, we can be a great distributor, and we can also be a phenomenal innovator. Now imagine, just on the innovation piece, that we operate in areas with 50% of the population is unbanked, that our mobile networks cover 90% of the population, and that we have a prepaid model that has cash in, cash out locations in every corner of our markets, human ATMs, and a trusted brand, and that customers give us money because it's prepaid every day of the week, every day of the week to top up. And imagine a world in which QR codes have become ubiquitously available, and every small merchant, little coffee shop, little mom and pop, has access to basically a terminal that has no cost to them because they can just download a QR code. What that means is, that we can only now be not just partners and distributors, but we can be great innovators and we can become the digital wallet of choice in every single one of our markets and make that transition, that value-added transition from telco into fitness. That is phenomenal room for innovation. Our Tigo money business in Latin America alone already has 5 million users, $50 million of revenue, and is transacting over $4 billion. That is moving from telco to fintech. That is moving from just being a dumb pipe to being a partner, a distributor, and an innovator. And that leaves me to simply say, if we get being a dumb pipe really, really well, then we can evolve into becoming the digital enabler of choice for a new era of this beautiful, beautiful, full of magical realism part of the world that we call Latin America. Gracias a todos. Para mí, se está metido significa compromiso. ¿Qué pasa? No me entiende. Un momento ya te explico. El compromiso que tenemos con todos nuestros clientes es donde se encuentra en su señal. Sea oh, thank you. Ya sea en la ciudad, en el este, bueno. Actually, Thank you. To to that yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Maurizio. Um, I think the vividness that you spoke of the, the power in LATAM did a lot to eliminate the solitude that you made mention of in the beginning. And one of the things that I was very struck by is, um, is the power of creating these digital highways that you talk about. In your experience, what's been the biggest bottleneck to accelerating the build for these digital highways? Um, I have to say that we need to uh, evolve our thinking as an industry. The, the time where telcos were cash rich is gone. Uh, we're no longer cash cows, by the way. Um, the time where big tolls could be extracted from the industry to participate is also gone. For all of these that I was describing to be real, I believe spectrum needs to be put on the table for the people. I believe that the more spectrum is made available, the lower the costs at which it is made available, the more money will be attracted, the more money these digital highways will be built with, and the sooner all of this will happen. 
Super. Well, very powerful. Thank you, Maurizio. Gracias.